Last week, Queens Park recognized April 16th as Equal Pay Day, marking the extra time from the beginning of the year the average woman needs to work to match the average man's income. And joining us now to detail what lies behind that pay gap in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Ed Ng. He is professor at the Rose School of Business at Dalhousie University. With us here in studio, Mary Cornish, lawyer and chair of the Equal Pay Coalition, Rafael Gomez, professor of employment relations at the University of Toronto, and Sheila Block, director of economic analysis at the Wellesley Institute. And we are happy, Ed Ng, to welcome you from the Maritimes and to our guests here in the studio. Good to have you all alongside again. Let's just get into this. Mary, how much do women make compared to men? Well, they make 31.5% um, less than men on average. And um, so basically, we're talking about a difference in actual money average income in Ontario of about $18,000. Per year? Per year. Sheila, if you look across, that's presumably across the spectrum in part-time, full-time, in every which way you look at it. If you just compare full-time job to full-time job, the gap presumably gets narrower, yes? Yeah, it shrinks a little bit, and it moves, uh, moves up to about 81 cents for every dollar that a man makes. We will start to, over the course of the discussion here, unpack why that is. Uh, let's get into this here. I've got something I want to read from Frank Bruni from the New York Times from just a few days ago, and it goes like this. Decades into the discussion about how to ensure women's equality, we have a culture that still places a different set of expectations and burdens on women and that still nudges or even shames them into certain roles. There was too little recognition of that last week at the White House, where President Obama practiced the timeless political art of oversimplification, reducing a messy reality into a tidy figure and saying that working women make only 77 cents for every dollar that working men earn. He left the impression that this was principally the consequence of direct discrimination in the form of unequal pay for the same job. Some of it is, and that's flatly unacceptable. But most of it, says Frank Bruni, isn't. And the misuse of the 77 cent statistic could actually hurt the important cause of giving women a fair shake because it allows people who don't value that goal a way to discredit those of us who do. And because it gives short shrift to dynamics that must be a part of any meaningful, truthful, constructive discussion. Lots to pick apart here. Ed Ng, let me get you on that first. Frank Bruni's point, what do you take from it? Um, I, I think it's really confusing when you throw a, an index of a number here because um, it clouds a lot of um, explanations behind that 77 cents to the dollar. While that number is meaningful when you do national comparisons, but uh, one thing that you had pointed out earlier, we don't make a distinction between part-time work and full-time work, but what's even more interesting is the fact that we haven't actually looked at the type of industries that uh, are contributing to this wage gap. There We're going to get to that. Hold off on that. We're going to get, I got a chart <laughs> for right. that too. So hold off on that for a second. But continue your All thought right. if you would. Right. I mean, uh, the, the thing is that uh, what's starting this, I do, uh, uh, my colleagues and I do um, research on millennials uh, in part because this is sort of a ge the generation that's been raised with very high self-esteem. Um, also because they have been raised with uh, messages of diversity and equality. So what we do is we look at, we ask two simple questions actually of the millennials. How much do you expect to make when you graduate from university or college? How much do you expect to make five years out? Now, the numbers that we have from, and this is, would be based on Canadian post-secondary students, is that um, the wage gap that we see initially is 13.5 cents to the dollar. In other words, uh, women expect to make 13.5 cents less than men to the dollar, but five years out, they expect to make anywhere from 17 to 24 percent. And the number that you're throwing me is far higher. So this tells me that, um, you know, in the pipeline, the, um, the, the gap is very small, but by the time you actually move into the workplace, it, it does get magnified. Now, it gets worse. Okay, hold off, hold off one right. second there. Ed. Uh, let me get to Raphael again on that Frank Bruni quote. Yeah. That the sort of trotting out of this in the state's 77 cent wage gap. Yeah. How helpful or not do you believe to the entire debate? Well, I think Ed mentioned just a small point, uh, but it was actually a very important one in this, in this sort of uh, explanation. It, it's good as a rough comparison across countries because that, that gap is narrower in some countries, the overall gap. But of course, the gap isn't meaningful if you don't account for, control for things like what, how many hours you've worked and, and what occupations you're in, um, because a lot of the econ economic work on pay discrimination, wage 
uh, differences focuses on not the gap, but the premium that men get versus women. And that shrinks, right? The premium meaning what? Premium is a distinction that economists make uh, when you control for any, in a good data set, you've got all these individual characteristics, how much experience the person had, have they taken time off of work to raise a child. You put all those things into the model, and suddenly this 30, well, 23 percent gap gets shrunk down to 10 percentage points. That's left as a residual, which you can't explain, given all the things you could control for, all the observable things like your experience, your education, tenure, experience. But but you're still left with this. There's still a gap at the end of the day. We wouldn't call it a gap, but a premium for men. A premium women. for men. Yeah, yeah. Mary, what do you want to call it? Well, I guess what I would say to my colleagues here on the panel is that the reason why we focus on the average annual earnings is that is actually what women have in their pockets at the end of the year, regardless of how economists or other people may attempt to say they're controlled for this and that, and in the end they don't really have much of a gap. In the end, women in Ontario bring home that much less. There are all kinds of contributing dynamics to that, and with respect, I don't think because you talk about that overall gap, you are ignoring those characteristics. In fact, the very reason that we look at it is to discuss them. In other words, the hourly wage difference, which is another way of looking at it, doesn't deal with the fact that part-time work and women predominating in part-time work. Why do they predominate in part-time work? How much of it is forced part-time work because they're unable to get full-time hours? How much of it is the fact that women who are more highly educated now can't get back into the workforce because of lack of affordable childcare. So in our view, the overall gap actually does help us to have that dialogue. And the dialogue where we talk about how if you control for all these statistics, we really don't have much of a gap, actually doesn't help us get at those issues. It doesn't help us get at those issues because it gives a false sense of... It gives a false sense. And also, we are trying to get to an Ontario that doesn't have the 34% gap. We're not trying to get to the one that has the controlled for a small gap. We're we're trying to get to an Ontario where women on average earn the same as men, where men start to take over more responsibilities for childcare, where employers start to value women's work in a better way in the occupations that they're in without saying that the problem is all women's bad choices around occupations. So that's the discussion. Let me, Sheila, ask you, in your analysis, is it actually possible to figure out how much of the gap you have to lay at the feet of just out and out discrimination? Um, I think I just have to repeat Mary's uh, statement here that that's the wrong question. Um, because out well, and we out, do that here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you always ask the wrong question. Absolutely, yeah. Um, because really what, what we have to look at is the complexity of women's labor market experience. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, women do far more work at home than than men do that women have far more responsibility for child rearing that if you can't and get taking care of older parents and taking too. care of older parents that what kind mm -hmm. of industries do women work in more importantly what kind of occupations do they work in um, and I, I looking at some data before I came on the show I was almost shocked to see that still 50 percent of women work in occupations that either administrative and the majority of those are clerical or sales and service. And so really it's about where women are working, what kinds of jobs they have access to, and to, to back it up to say they're you know, a male economist with the same degree as me, with uh, mm -hmm. the same number of years of experience, makes 10 cents or 10% you know, more than I do, is not an interesting question from a policy perspective. It's an interesting question from a talk show perspective. Yeah, it's an interesting question from a talk show perspective, but, but maybe. You don't but care about the discrimination angle? I really think that the broader policy questions is that we important. need to address are why are women, uh, why are so many more women at, in low-wage jobs rather than why does Raphael make 10 10 percent more than I do. I, I think. think uh, oh, we'll look into that later. Yeah, that's statistically, to, as a statistical average, artifact, yeah. To follow up on Ed's point of earlier, we do have a bit of a list here. This was compiled by Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, and it separated the jobs that pay the most mm -hmm. and the jobs that pay the least, and who tends to be in mm -hmm. those jobs. So, mm -hmm. Sheldon, let's bring this up now, if we can. Uh, the petroleum engineering industry, 87 percent male. Pharmacy, Pharmaceutical Sciences Administration, actually a little more than half female, but math and computer science, two-thirds male. Aerospace engineering, 88% male. Chemical engineering, 72% male. These are the 
the places where you can make the most money, and as we see, they are overwhelmingly dominated by men. On the flip side, let's look at the least remunerative majors, as we call them that. Counseling psychology, almost three quarters female. Early childhood education, look at that, 97% occupied by women. Theology and religious vocations, two thirds male. Human services and community organization, 81% female. Social work, 88% female. Okay, Mary, you look at those numbers and what do you infer? Well, I, I think what you see is that actually the, the occupational sex segregation, which is kind of what drives the pay gap, it still exists and exists to a large degree. And you'll find even if you look into um, occupational categories, and Sheila may have more to say about this, in each occupational category, women earn less than men in all of the occupational categories. So you see, and I guess this also gets to the issue of what is discrimination? Because I think some people think it's only discrimination if I look at the two of you and decide to pay you less than Sheila, and then that's discrimination mm -hmm. because that's wrong. If we have equal qualifications, uh, exactly. experience, all but, that. But in fact, systemic discrimination is, is, is something that would influence, and in fact, when Ontario did its Green Paper in 1985, before it got its Pay Equity Act, the Green Paper talked about the whole gap, which at that point was actually 38% was the gap, okay? And at that point, they said, well, the Pay Equity Act is only going to deal with the part that in a workplace you're comparing men's and women's work. The rest of the gap is also tainted by discrimination in the sense of what are all of the factors which mean that, um, that women may be more in part-time work, et cetera. Now, back then, we used to not think of women as being the primary the ones who had the most educational attainments, right? But as we moved through the 80s, 90s, and forward, that is now the case. So one of the questions to answer is, given these very high educational attainments, why isn't the gap much smaller, right? Let me follow up on Ed with that. Ed, that list that we gave out there was something that you were referring to earlier. And mm -hmm. I wonder whether I can get you to comment on this. Is part of the problem, or part of the explanation for the wage gap, that women just aren't going into the fields that tend to pay more. Yeah, I mean, it, there were a few issues that were raised here. One of it is, I keep hearing the term discrimination. Now, in terms of address, addressing discrimination, you can, you, you can simply look at public policy, things like, you know, uh, pay equity legislation, but nobody ha so that's on the demand side, the employer side. Nobody actually look at the supply side, the women themselves who are entering into the workforce. So there are, there are a lot of factors that contribute to why women make less. One of it is, you know, the theory of individual differences. Women have, you know, lower self-efficacy. But the other thing is the socialization itself. Now, despite the fact that women are entering universities in large numbers, um, in our survey of this potential or, or the, the workforce that's you know, coming in, in, into the economy, into the labor market, um, we asked them what kind of uh, work values do they prefer. Women inevitably prefer beta careers. I'll explain that in a second. Men, on the other hand, prefer alpha careers. Alpha careers simply refer to they look for financial uh, gains, they look for career advancement, and work centrality is a big part of, of their identity. When we ask women the same questions, they tend to value work-life balance. They tend to value uh, making a contribution to society at large, which is why we see that women tend to congregate or segregate in uh, occupations such as being you know, teachers, social workers, what we call health and human services. Okay, I mean, let me get Sheila on this. Let me get Sheila to respond right. to that. Does, does what Ed just say ring true to you and partly explain, again, the gap? I, you know, we're moving far outside my area of expertise in terms of those kinds of motivations. I think what we have to look at is what is the value that we place on women's work versus men's work? So um, are, are those kinds of caregiving jobs undervalued as compared to other kinds of jobs with similar skill levels that, uh, that, are, that are performed by men? I also think how are women socialized and how are men socialized? And, you know, really should the question be that we really need to socialize men so that they care more about contributing to society and work-life balance and they should actually be moving into women's jobs. And if they did, maybe the pay in those jobs would actually increase. Maybe get them to be a little more attentive to work-life balance and less to getting yeah. every single dollar out of the company they can. You know, okay. one, of, one of the, I think, a very good example of this in Ontario is to just look at how we value two things that are publicly funded uh, by governments. 
One of them is the home care worker, which is, as we've seen, predominantly female, mm -hmm. um, and is funded at about $15 an hour. Okay, they go into our houses, they, they, they provide important care. Um, they, uh, for example, don't get their mileage paid for, um, often don't have benefits, paid $15 an hour, providing very important care. And so that's them on one side, predominantly female. Then we have on the other side an OPP officer. An OPP officer at the max rate, which you get after three years, who has a high school education, uh, police college, also requires a driver's license, but we couldn't even imagine him not being paid for his mileage, earns $51 an hour. So we have a personal support worker earning a third of what we have a police officer working. And also, personal support workers often encounter dangerous situations in houses, and they often en encounter abuse. So I'm just saying, just try and look at the two pictures and try and figure out, yes, I think discrimination comes into the way in which we value that worker, but we still want them to perform a valuable service, but we're not going to pay them what may be and certainly is not worth that much less. But if I, I would count, I mean, I, your examples are, are well made and I think they're, they're accurate in the terms of valuation of what as a society we, we should value uh, and uh, certainly home care work is, is, is central I mean, taking care of our parents and our, our family members but two things one institutions uh, OPP just doesn't get its wages because they're male police officers they have a very strong union that supports their interests most of these um, care workers are in a uh, an industry in which it's been farmed out um, to private providers they're we have a CCAC they're no contracted union. out there's no union so you have institutions. So there, this work on comparative wage gaps has found that one of the biggest predictors of where the gaps are smallest is where unionization is largest. So the, you're, just so I understand, you're, you're arguing this is not so much a male-female thing as it's a union-non-union -union thing. It is a male-female in the, in the sense that, yes, yeah, so the home care work is done by primarily females. Mm -hmm. uh, OPP uh, police officers are predominantly male. But the institution that can explain the bulk of that wage difference is the fact that they have a union. It's an institutional story. Except there are un the unions have been lobbying. There are unionized uh, home care workers lobbying. In fact, what drives it, I would say, mm -hmm. is government funding at a low rate, of yeah. which then it has private people competing around it. But essentially, the government is paying fifteen dollars okay. an hour in one but situation. If you had an institution and the like a union to fight for those rights, those pay those those monies would and they would. Not you wouldn't have to wait for a, a Toronto Star, you know, expose to find out the conditions. They'd be there all the time. Well, there are, what I'm trying to say to you is, there are unions who are there, but they're still dealing with a government which funds it at fifteen dollars, and the government which negotiates with the OPP and negotiates fifty-one dollars. Mm. So I, your argument, is, just again, so I want to be clear here. Your argument is, if society in general, the government of Ontario in particular, valued that work in the home as much as it values keeping our streets safe, right. there would be more proximity Correct. in those two wages. And that part of a government responsibility, which is one of the things we've talked about in our uh, report around Equal Pay Day, is one of the government responsibilities of kind of mainstreaming policies to close the gap. One of them would be to look at your funding practices. How much are you giving to fund for public services where women are performing them? And is it comparable? Or have we had discrimination come into those funding practices. Sheila. I think Raphael raises an important point though is that we have to look at broader policies that can actually have, a, have an influence as well as looking at the specifics of equal pay. And so very clearly easier access to unionization reduces the pay gap. When we do things like uh, improve minimum standards like um, the minimum wage, because more women are working at minimum wage than men, then you're, at, then you're also shrinking the pay gap. So we really have to look at a wide number of policies, some of which would have a positive impact on all low wage workers, but disproportionately for women. And not just public policies, workplace policies. Claudia Golden's uh, professor, labor economist in, at Harvard, has found that one of the biggest explanations for the wage difference that's left <laughs> after you control those 10, 15 percentage points you want to, whatever you want to argue, has been workplace inflexibility. There's workplaces that don't offer flexible scheduling, for example, working from home. That lack of flexibility disproportionately falls on women and they will then take, find the part-time job. They won't work full-time or they won't just not work in that workplace. So if you foster workplace 
flexibility in, of, of some measure. This does a lot to, again, equalize this, this gap. Ed Ng, let me get you back in here to uh, mm -hmm. give me your view on the following, because we're looking at all sorts of different, different explanations for why the gap is where it's sure. at. What role do salary expectations by men versus by women play in the gap? Uh, that's a good question, Steve. I just want to cycle back to the data that we've been working with because these are primarily um, pre-career individuals. These are the millennials who haven't entered into the workforce yet. Um, even prior to entry into the labor market, women reported lower salary expectations post-graduation and five years out. And of course, that gets magnified, as I've indicated earlier. Uh, part of this is explained by the fact that women rely on other women as informants. I mean, before you negotiate your first salary, you tend to talk to other people. So uh, you know, part of it is structural, what's in the labor market. Part of it is organizational and the institution itself, whether it's you know, in a unionized environment or not. But I just want to cycle back to the individual difference, uh, which sort of explains in large part what's happening in the pipeline prior to, uh, prior to women entering into the workforce itself. Just by having a lower expectation, um, when they negotiate the first salary, then they end up having a much lower uh, sort of starting salary to begin with. So women rely on other women for information as salary informants, but not only that, when we ask men and women uh, in terms of um, the referent other, uh, how much do you think other men or other, other individuals uh, get paid? Men tend to overestimate uh, other people's salaries compared to women, and women tend to underestimate other people's salaries. So g given that you are armed with inaccurate information, uh, that in itself contributes to sort of your initial starting salary that you negotiate. And of course, you add on things like um, you know, the institutional uh, differences, union versus non-union, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole notion of while well, men's work gets valued more, um, and, and the organizational inflexibility or a lack of um, progressive workplace policies, then that just magnifies the gap that we have, uh, that we see that was uh, uh, evident in in the pipeline before women even get into the labor market. All right, Mary, what's your view on that? Well, one of the, I think it's important the issue of what the pay policies are, and one of the way one of the new measures I think countries are looking at, and the European Union started to do this, is requiring employers to establish pay transparency policies. In other words, that in a workplace, um, people know the person who comes in it doesn't have to guess what the pay is for the salary that they're for the job that they're applying to. They already know what the range is of it and, and are able to deal with it without, and I think Obama also just brought in in a federal executive order, a requirement of the Department of Labor to try and require federal contractors to have more transparent pay practices so they could see whether people who were taking taxpayers' dollars were in fact paying fairly. So one of the measures we've talked about in Ontario would be the government bringing in a pay transparency policy so that employers would have to make it clear in a workplace both so that you would know whether your fellow worker was making the same as you for the mm -hmm. same work and hadn't just arrived in and negotiated a higher salary. And sometimes I quite agree that structurally what happens is men may come from a place where they had a higher salary, right? So they start at the higher salary and the woman doesn't really know what the pay is supposed to be. So sometimes that's how you get the exact same job being paid differently, right? Or men come in, this is the other way it can happen, is men come in, there's a grid, and they start higher on the grid because they were paid more before. So those are the kinds of structural things you could address. G given Ed's research, do you think there'd be a difference between men and women when they look at these lists? Would, it, would a man feel more, uh, feel he's being treated more unfair if they saw that the wage was being paid uh, at a greater wage for someone who's doing comparable work than a woman? Do you think there's differences in relative income according to gender? It, sorry, that he would think that it, if you knew that people were being paid differently, would, would a you, woman be less concerned about exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think a woman would be okay. less concerned about it at all. You see, I don't think people want to be paid unfairly. I don't... Except income. Uh, um, there have been I, studies done of relative... Once, uh, Ed, Ed, stand by. Well, uh, Raphael, except, make his point, and then I'll go to you. Except there have been studies of, of how people feel and when they're known, when their relative income is factored in. Actually, women feel less deprived. Pretty that relative income, income has a less of an effect. You're saying on studies their, prove women feel less put upon if they're making less prove, money than you men? You never say prove. <laughs> sure. uh, that inequality, Indicate. yeah, that, that the fact that you're paid less than someone has less of an effect on your perceived... Why would that be the case? Exactly why. 
Um, let let okay. me just chime in right there. Um, John Hollenbeck at Michigan State actually did a study way back, and this echo so maybe provides some kind of an explanation for what Raphael had just mentioned. Now, women feel underpaid. There's no question about it. We see those data every day in the newspaper. While they may feel underpaid, they don't feel undercompensated because they derive sort of their worth not necessarily in income or in, in sort of financial terms. They look at it from a job satisfaction perspective. That's why they go to health and human services. So I think by and large, women may be less sensitive to the fact that, well, I'm paid a little less, but I'm OK because I'm sort of doing something that's meaningful to society. Ed, you can't see her, but Mary's doing a slow <laughs> boil here. I, I, just, I think that has nothing to do with the reality. I've, I've practiced in this area. I've dealt with people around pay disputes and pay equity for um, mm -hmm. almost 40 years. And I have, and a lot of times people in the healthcare sector, and I don't ever meet anybody who says, I went into social work so that I could be paid less than everybody else. I meet lots of people who, and this is no doubt, and maybe perhaps this is what Ed's talking about, the caring dilemma is when women are placed in a position often where, for example, in a work situation, they're worried about going out on strike because they may impair their, um, the people who they're taking care of, okay? Um, so that's sometimes a dilemma which occurs with women, but that women don't really want to be paid appropriately, I haven't ever experienced. That's not the question. It's whether the fact that you're paid uh, relatively less matters to you as much as a man. If there's a differential in gender, that could explain Ed's findings, right? I mean, that could explain some of that. Sheila? I think we really have to be careful in terms of kind of what part of the labor market we're talking about. So if, for example, you're making minimum wage in Ontario and you are below the low income cutoff, you're living in poverty, I, I actually think that that will very matter, much matter to you and matter to you and, and in terms of how much you can support your family. Whether you're male so, or female. Whether you're male or female. Uh, but I also think women who are in those positions um, will be very much concerned with what they're making. So I, I think we really have to look at how there are very different experiences in the labor market and some of those labor market and even when we're trying to separate out the gender differences, we have to look at them, also those differences by race and by immigration mm. status. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about um, kind of, when we're, when we're talking about low income workers who would very much have, feel and have an impact of the, any change in salary and any differential in salary, I think um, that might be a different experience than again, um, I am less concerned about wh whether Raphael makes 10% more than I do. It, it's, it's less of an issue for me. It doesn't have an impact on whether I can put food on the table for my kids. Can I, uh, again, I just want to make sure I understand. Did you just say you care, if you and Raphael had the same job, you would care less if he made more than you? I think from a public policy perspective, that there are different issues here, yeah. um, right? And so that from a public policy perspective, if Raphael and I make less, if I are doing the same job and I'm making less, absolutely that's an issue. But I think if you're looking at overall women's experience and what kind of jobs they're in, what access they have to childcare, the complexity of those issues I think are the much more re relevant public policy well, issue. This, it, it, okay, at the risk of getting into it here, this, this is something I hear about all the time when people say, yes, there's a wage gap and it's because of choices women make. Mm. Now you hear that all the time, right? You want to refute that, I presume. I do. Okay, <laughs> fire away. I'm giving you the platform to do so. Well, I, I think, it, here's, I just was on CFRB last week where I had the same thing put to me, it's career mm -hmm. choices. So first of all, one of the things that starts with it is that even if we take the issue of, of uh, women have ch children, right? So that then translates into women choose to do things. Well, actually, while women may actually birth the child, uh, parents have children and parents make choices. So that's the first start, is it isn't just all about women's choices as to what they do, it's society's choices to have children and, and parents' choices. So, so that's kind of even a start on the whole issue of systemically looking at occupational choices to start off with. But the other part of it is this notion that people are um, choosing jobs that 
the, the uh, and I guess this goes back to this question of whether or not I'm going to choose to have a job. Uh, it, I, I choose to be, let's say, what was it, the counselor that we saw there, this social worker counselor mm -hmm. or whatever. All right. So these are highly skilled jobs, and the person chooses to be the social worker counselor. Somebody else chooses to pay that social worker counselor less money than a male-dominated work would get. Can so I, that's can partly I pipe from, in here? Mm -hmm. It's the market. You absolutely can. It's the market that decides. Okay. No, uh, you want to get me on the market? Okay. We well, go the, on to the market. The, the market decides that a social worker has less value in terms of remuneration than the OPP employers, officer. Employers decide what they're going to do. Okay. So this issue around the market, it, uh, my favorite example around the market is when we had a shortage of nurses, this was back, I can't remember now, back in the 90s, mm -hmm. did we pay nurses more? No. What we did is we went to other countries to find nurses. When we had a shortage of IT people around the millennium, what did we do? We paid them more money, right? So in other words, the market actually works differently for men and women. And one of the things we're trying to do is to get the male market-based wages and have women be able to get those kind of wages. <laughs> Raphael. Well, it makes a good, you make a good point. The, um, the institutions and policies reinforce See, sociologists would call those choices already systemic discrimination, right? Yeah. Segregation, occupational segregation starts because teachers early on have dissuaded women from going to certain careers. So there's a sociological argument presupposing that you make these choices free of any biases already. And that, that could be why women are in occupations that tend to pay, more, pay less. But why do they pay less? Think about, you mentioned earlier, most women are in retail. What's the biggest for, temporary foreign worker uh, job category? Retail. So you're so apparently it's hard to find people for these jobs. Well, guess what? Pay them more and you'll find people. But if you perpetuate low-wage mm -hmm. places where you're not going to find a person to find this job, then guess what? These employers can legitimately say, oh, look, I, I put a posting. No one came calling. Hmm. We need more you know, temporary okay. foreign workers. And these, the temporary foreign worker program is not like an, Im an immigrant who comes in and works. You're, you're locked in. There's no mobility. Mm -hmm. So these wages are not allowed to rise. With just a few minutes to go here, uh, I do want to hear from the minister. Uh, Teresa Peruzza was in this chair, minister responsible for women's issues uh, from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, in terms of what the Ontario government planned to do about this wage gap, the full interview with her is on the website. Let's play a clip right now, then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. What we're hearing again is, is the need to start speaking to girls earlier than the end of high school in terms of what some of the choices and opportunities are in terms of, of different, uh, different careers or different professions and speaking to them in grade school. It's about uh, work-life balance and asking employers for flexibilities in the workplace. And I mean, the other element or commitment that certainly we just recently made was the increase in the minimum wage and the legislation that's bring, being brought forward to, to tie that to the CPI. So that's an element that's been brought forward as well. Okay, if we had more transparency, which you think would assist matters, if we valued differently the work that women tend to do, apropos of that chart we gave earlier, versus what men uh, tend to do, uh, what else do we need to have, Sheila, on that list that you think might narrow that gap? Um, one of the things um, is, that, like Raphael mentioned, easier access to unionization in the kinds of industries that women are more likely to work in. So again, in the retail sector, in, in home care, uh, home care early those childhood kind of, education, those kinds of places. So that's one of the things. Um, I would really reinforce and add what Mary said, is we really need adequate funding for those female-dominated caring, uh, caring kinds of industries as well. Those are two things that I think are really essential. Ed, I've got 30 seconds left. Why don't you take it and tell me what you think the role government can play in this? Well, first of all, I want to cycle back to what your chart We haven't got a lot of time to cycle here, Ed. I've got 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. Now, essentially, what I found in my study is that um, uh, women actually benefit from uh, professions or industries, the STEM discipline, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, whereby they actually enjoy that structural advantage that men does. So what public policy needs to do is to actually promote more women into those industries or sectors where there is a um, going back to Raphael's term, a premium for men. So over time, when you have a critical mass, that premium gets reduced for men, and you'll find that a greater number of women going into you know, a certain industry would tip the balance um, in favor of more egalitarian pay. Gotcha. 
That was nicely done in 30 seconds. Ed Ng, we appreciate you being on the line from Halifax, Nova Scotia, you from Dalhousie University. We thank as well thank Mary Cornish from the Equal Pay Coalition, Rafael Gomez from the University of Toronto, Sheila Block from the Wellesley Institute. Appreciate all of your participation here today. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.